afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this month's Foundations webinar. Foundations webinar. I'm Paul. I'm from Foundations. Very good to see you today. Um, if you haven't come across Foundations before, we're the National Body for Home Improvement Agencies in England, and we're fun funded by the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government to help with training events, workshops, advice, support, anything you need around home improvement agencies and disabled facilities grants, we will try to help with. So um, find out more at foundations.uk.com. Here's what we've got today. So today we're going to, get, going to be going through the DFG quality standard. We've um, done some tweaks to it during, um, during the last six months or so. So we're going to go through that um, as it's been revised and we're going to do lots of polls to see um, where you all stand in the uh, um, different categories of the DFG quality standard. We've got Kevin from Norwich who's going to talk about um, their new approach to 10 new neutral adaptations, particularly in um, council housing. We've got some entries in, or entries, we've, we've had some submissions anyway for, for how people have designed the shower that I mentioned in the, the last couple of road shows. And then last but not least, we'll have the DFG surgery at the end. The DFG surgery, your questions answered. So if you're, um, if you've got any DFG related questions you want to pose, then if you put them in the Q and A box, which should uh, come up on your, on your Zoom toolbar. We'll try and answer those for you at the end. Poll time. Let's see what you think. Right, so we've got lots of polls today. So this is the first one. As usual, what's your job? And then the other one, I thought we'd do slightly differently this time. I thought I'd, I'd see what you're wearing because I've been through some of the old um, webinars over the last couple of weeks. And I started out wearing a, um, a shirt then a t-shirt and um, today I'm in a hoodie. So I'm, I'm seeing kind of how far everybody else has gone during, uh, during the last six months in terms of going casual. So I'll launch the poll now. So what's your job and what are you wearing today? As usual, if, if you can't see the, um, the poll, then it's probably to do with the uh, pop-up blocker on your browser. So if, um, if that hasn't popped up for you, if you can work out how to unblock it, it's usually um, a little icon in your um, address bar in your browser, or if you pop your answer in the chat box, we'll, we can pick them up from there. Okay, that's the end of the poll. Let's see what we've got. So we've got um, OTs just ahead of technical officers this month, just ahead of case workers and um, actually, actually managers just behind technical officers there. And let's see what everyone's wearing. So mostly jeans and a t-shirt. A uh, few like me in a hoodie. Two people in their pajamas, and three, <laughs> three people in their underwear. <laughs> Sure, this be cold for that, but uh, interesting, interesting. Okay, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do future, future webinars in either my pajamas or just my underwear. You'll be very pleased to know. Right, we'll get into some more polls in a minute. So, just a reminder: if you're um, in charge of the kind of DFG program at your local authority, that the annual data return to government is due at the end of this week. Um, there's a hundred percent return last year, so obviously hoping for the same this year. Just over half are in. We're in by um, Friday, so there's about just half left to go. And if any problems at all, please email us at info@foundations.uk.com, and we'll see what we can do to help you. And the other, the other big news that we've got. 
is um, we've got a virtual roadshow coming up on the 1st of December. And um, if, if I'm sure some of you went to our DFG roadshows when we did them live, so we're doing a virtual version. Again, it's three sessions. So the first session is on um, all the latest research in terms of um, an update on Bathout 1, where they did a pilot study on how the delays in doing shower adaptations impact on people's well-being, and we're just about to start phase two of that, which is the main research. So you'll hear from um, Philip Whitehead about Bath Out. We've also got um, a report from Leeds Becky University, where they looked at the DFG process um, and how uh, that's as kind of where the delays are in the process for that, which led on to the um, Innovate project that we're, we're doing with Leeds Becky at the moment. And there's also another report from um, City University in London, where they looked at professional roles, um, particularly around kind of OTs and caseworkers as trusted assessors were introduced and as OTs were introduced in housing teams. And it's looking at the impact on um, kind of people's feeling of, of kind of well-being and um, their kind of professional status as they went through that change process, which, which again, a kind of really interesting report for those of you going through similar similar issues at the moment. The second session around lunchtime is on getting adapting again. So we've got um, got a couple of sessions on virtual assessments, one from a council's perspective who are introducing them, and then another from AbilityNet looking at how they help service users to um, engage with virtual assessments. We've got a session on um, OT waiting lists and some research on um, length of those and, and some options around them around the country. And then we've got a presentation from a local authority that despite the pandemic and all the issues have already spent all their budget for this year and uh, are starting to look to spend next year's and, and how they've done that during the, uh, the recent times. And then the final session of the day is uh, National Healthy Housing Awards. So we haven't been able to um, host a live event, which, which is a shame because we had wine and everything last year, but this year it's, it's going to be online and we'll be awarding the a range of categories from Home Improvement Agency of the Year, Adaptation Service of the Year, um, OT of the Year, Technical Officer of the Year, Casework of the Year and a few others. So that will be live in the afternoon. So you're all invited to that. It's You can register now for free. It's on a system called AirMeet, which we did last month's uh, webinar on, which means that um, you, can, you can also talk to each other. There'll be exhibitor booths, there'll be speed networking, there'll be breakout sessions, um it should all be a, a lot of fun and a good day so um dan if, if i can ask oh, see dan's already just put the link into the um into the chat so if, if while i'm talking if you want to go and register yourself um for the roadshow and the awards which is two weeks today that would be great to see you there on the first of december so dfg quality standard this is something we set up um, or devised a couple of years ago. In fact, in fact, I remember writing the first version in a, in a travel lodge at Wembley, Wembley Central. Um, it, was, it was something we did kind of started before we began the DFG review and it was, it was starting to get quite a big document in itself. And after doing 300 pages of review, we wanted to do something that was kind of a bit more short and snappy. So it follows the style of nice quality standards and it's built around 10 quality statements and we've um, developed or tried to share some good practice around each of those 10 quality statements. And it focuses on arrangements that support people to remain living independently in the community. So it's, it's much installing showers, stair lifts and ramps. It, it looks at a, a wide range of issues as you'll see at the moment. So it's not particularly about the process for a statutory DFG G application. It's around supporting um, the wider population to live in a well-adapted home. A lot of it is based on existing good practice, including some of these documents. And the thing we've added in is a new rating scale. So for each of the 10 areas of the quality standard, what we've done is um, come up with some ratings. So you can assess whether you're not yet established, have plans in place, have an established system, have a mature system, or have an exemplary system. So from, from top to bottom. So 
what we're going to do today using the, the poll function of Zoom is go through each one and see um, where everybody stands on this kind of new rating cell. So this is the first time we've used it. And the idea is that we'll kind of have a benchmark of where most local authorities are across the country. So that if, if you want to kind of come back to this later, you can um, assess where you are against um, kind of other local authorities who are, who are here today. So starting at, uh, start at number 10 and working our way down to number one. Number 10 is the um, element of the quality standard is value for money. So all the details of this are on the foundation's website, but in summary, value for money is around having a regular review of your specifications, having efficient procurement through frameworks and tender portals, rather than um, having multiple quotes for, for every single job. It's about engaging with your supply chain. It, it's around having good management of contractors, so kind of how you deal with them how you accredit them to be on an approved list and then how you manage them after that. And then also kind of looking at um, how you kind of have elements of aspirational design and also build in recycling perhaps into um, your adaptations if, if, for instance, a stale if needs to be removed and, and reused for somebody else. So in terms of how we've graded this one, so starting from the bottom and working up, so if your system is not yet established, it would mean that you have multiple quotations for routinely sought from, for grant applications, and you don't have any systems in place to assess and approve contractors. Next step up would be plans in place. So you have a standard specification that's been established that gives you a robust approach to cost and quality that you're developing, and you have an agreed approach to establishing a list of approved contractors. If you're at established, then you do have a maintained list of contractors working to a schedule of rates for some applications. Next step up for mature is you have a proactive use of the schedule of rates and dynamic procurement systems. You have a maintained list of approved contractors and you have framework agreements with equipment manufacturers and suppliers. And then finally for exemplary, Subcontractors are rated by grant recipients with feedback publicly available, so kind of TripAdvisor type system. It's available for reference for future applicants and you measure the social value of the works that you do. So the poll for this one, just asking you to rate um, not yet established plans in place, established, mature or exemplary. Just what you think, top of your head, where, where do you stand on this one? Thank you to those who put your answers in the comments. If you, if you can't vote, we'll add those into the results afterwards. So for this one, um, in the lead is mature. Got a handful at exemplary. Um, some established, some plans in place, and a few not yet established. So quite a range in terms of value for money. Okay, next one is around process. So disabled people know from the outset how long an adaptation is likely to take to complete. You have agreed procedures from first contact to completion. Um, you have continual improvements to the process. Timescales are published. You do some benchmarking and uh, do you use prioritization. So again, start from um, the bottom working way up, not yet established, so you don't have an agreed process in place and you have separate systems for assessments and applications. For plans in place, you, you're going to review your and improve your process and timescales, or you're planning to. Um, established, you have documented and agreed processes in place from first contact all the way through to completion. 
Mature um, timescales are measured and reported and improvements to the process have been made in the last year. And then the top exemplary expected timescales are published in benchmark. Process is continually refined to reduce timescales. So where do you fit on this scale? Okay, so again, mature is the um, slightly in the lead for this one, followed by established. I think uh, similar number exemplary and just a couple that are, are not yet established on this one. So I think this one was slightly higher than the last one. But we, we will collate all the results at the end and, um, and share them with you so you can see um, see where, where you are if you want to benchmark yourselves afterwards. So the next one is around housing options. So disabled people are supported to move home if they want to. So that's around having housing options advice, a register of adaptive properties and support to move home. So again, starting from the bottom working up, not yet established is there's no alternative options to home adaptations are offered to potential grant applicants. Uh, plans in place, you have a training plan for staff and information on options is being collected. For established alternative housing options are routinely considered as part of the process. For mature, policies will support moves where it will lead to better outcomes with support on the decision making. And then finally, for exemplary, advice on housing options is routinely offered and there is practical and emotional support to move if that provides the best outcome. And there's a maintained register of adapted properties. So for housing options, where do you fit on the scale? So I'll end that one, I'll share the results with you. So um, mature even higher on this one, I think, and, and a few more exemplary as well. Um, Steve, you were exemplary and now down to not yet established. That doesn't sound good, <laughs> that doesn't sound good. Um, please let us know why. So much, yeah, I think that's probably the highest of the highest of the three so far. So next one, having a housing assistance policy. So this is a housing assistance or regulatory reform order policy um, that allows you to meet local needs. So um, you have things like um, policies to cover cost of works over £30,000, different use of the test resources. You have an appeals process, so you're not fettering discretion. Uh, you may reduce bureaucracy and um, have a process to regularly review your policy as well. So again, starting from the bottom, not yet established means you have no housing assistance policy published or updated in the last three years. Uh, plans in place, you've got a policy in development and a date set in the forward plan. Established and you've got uh, policy approved by the council and published within the last three years. Mature and the policy has been reviewed and updated based on new evidence and experienced contains some outcome-based and person-centered measures. And then for exemplary, um, you can show that it's based on evidence, for example, stock condition survey or other um, demographic information. Um, it's linked to other published strategies and local priorities, and it's been reviewed within the last two years. So 
on your housing assistance policy, where do you fit? Okay, I think we've got all the votes there. So this one is, I think, the first time we've had established in the lead. So this one is slightly lower, um, which I guess means that most poli or a lot of policies are maybe a little out of date at the moment. Perhaps would uh, would benefit from a refresh. Okay, and this is number six. So th this is the last one for now, and then we'll um, take a little break from polling. So this is around having a tenure neutral approach. So disabled people can access assistance with adaptations regardless of their tenure. So it's likely to mean you have protocols in place with housing associations, um, equivalent procedures, if you have retained council housing stock and you do some work with private landlords. So, not yet established means there are no, no agreements in place with housing providers, no proactive work with private landlords, and likely to be longer time scales for council housing tenants. Plans in place, you've got active and ongoing discussions going with landlords. Established, you have joint working with a range of landlords and most adaptations are delivered in a timely way. Mature, you have a strategic agreement on the delivery of adaptations with arrangements for discussing cases and information is available for tenants and landlords. And exemplary, you have formal agreements on costs, protocols on permissions, um, you work together on having adaptive new build properties, and you pretty much have equality of delivery across all tenures. So where do you rate on the tenure neutral? Okay, so this one's um, this one's somewhere in the middle. So about half of you, nearly half are at established. And there's about a quarter have plans in place or not yet established. And about a quarter are either exemplary or mature. So um, real variation across the country in terms of um, approaches to tenure or issues with tenure. So th thank you for those. But we'll come back to the final five um, in a little while. But while we're talking about being tenure neutral. And now it's time for the guest. Okay, so we've got uh, Kevin, Kevin Ayers with us today from um, Norwich City Council's Home Improvement Team. And um, he's going to tell us all about their new approach to um, adaptations in the council housing stock in particular. So um, over to you, Kevin. I'll just give you remote control. There you go. Um, I think if anyone's got any questions, if you put them in the Q&As, um, I'll take a look at them at the end of the presentation, if that's okay for everyone. Um, and uh, so, so put your questions in there and I'll, I'll look at them at the end about through my presentation. Um, so I'm here today to talk about Norwich City Council's tenure neutral service, which is kind of in its infancy. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to get the screen. There we go. Um, before we begin, uh, there's some acronyms that I might use throughout the presentation that people might not be aware of, so uh, it might be useful for people to understand if I mention HRA or Housing Revenue Account. As a stock owning authority, um, Norwich City Council owns a, a lot of council properties and the council 
rent, the, the rent that people pay goes into what's known as a housing revenue account. Housing revenue accounts are all the rental incomes uh, for tenants, from tenants to the council, um, and they are ring fenced. And they can only be used, the money that comes into the council can only be put to the HRA, can only be used for the purposes of council benefit council tenancies. So it pays for stuff like kitchen upgrades, bathroom upgrades, disabled adaptations. Um, it pays for all the staff related to landlord services um, and anything to do with uh, council properties is funded out of the housing revenue account. It is separate to the general fund. So if in, in, a, in a stock owning authority, if you don't own, if you Sorry, if you don't um, work within the landlord services department, then you are funded from the general fund. It's uh, quite useful to understand because I'll probably refer to it throughout my presentation. So a bit about Norwich. Norwich is a really small geographical area district. It's only about 40 square kilometres uh, in size, but it's quite densely populated, as you'd expect with it, it being a city. Um, we've got about 139, well, 140,000 residents. We've got a big portion of owner occupiers, but equally, we've got a really big stock within Norwich of, of council properties. One in four properties is a council property. We've got a stock of about 15,000 uh, properties. So it's quite a big, we're quite a big landlord. We're a young population. We, we, we sit a uh, medium range of around about 40 within the, within the um, population and not so much of our residents are older people. However, it is a tale of two cities because we've got some quite severe pension of poverty within Norwich. So we've got less older people, but of those older people, there's a lot more that are experiencing pension poverty. Same applies to children. We've got quite a high proportion of um, pension. Uh, um, children child poverty as well as that we've got some real um discrepancies between our best wards and worst wards for life expectancy so it's quite shocking that within norwich our most deprived ward there's a 10-year life expectancy difference for men uh, compared to their, their the, our, our least deprived ward and so it's a real tale of two cities and, and when it comes to adaptation work that, that is quite an interesting dynamic that we have to, to uh, deal with. So historically Norwich, when it comes to adaptations, Norwich has had a private sector home improvement agency delivered by an in-house team where an integrated team consisting of both housing staff and social services and occupational therapy staff. So we're completely integrated and work really well with social services. They're part of my team delivering a, 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 a holistic service for people. We've got a better care fund budget um, that, that we get from the county council via the, or it comes from the central government via the county council. We work with commissioners on identifying how best to spend that money. Um, so through that, we have our statutory DFG, but we also have quite a large range of discretionary uh, packages of assistance available. On the council side, historically, adaptations has been delivered by multiple different organisations, contractors, housing property services, social services, um, and everyone involved really has been quite distinct organisations. Adaptations have been funded by, um, by the HRA budget, um, and it's very much been an in-house landlord perspective driven disabled adaptation policy. So council tenants historically haven't had DFGs, they have had disabled adaptations provided to them by the landlord, but with a policy based approach. And that policy has been around lots of different things, but, but it's been very much like what's best use of stock. To, is, is it right to adapt to property? So in September of last year, the Home Improvement Agency was restructured into the housing service. So historically, we've been outside of housing service, and last year I was transferred into landlord services in effect. And part of that restructure was uh, a new HRA funded OT was created, and there was an instruction, it was a quite vague instruction for me to set up a, a tenure neutral service. But otherwise, it was quite a blank template. So 
they get, gave them to the, the higher ups, the people who decided that we needed to restructure and change what was happening in the council tenants, uh, create an OT role because they thought that was the right thing to do. There was no real identification of what that OT would be doing or what, what the need was. There was just a, a kind of arbitrary thought process that OTs might be beneficial. Um, and broadly, there was a, a vague instruction of set up a tenure neutral service. But otherwise, I, I was given quite a blank template. So from September last year, I spent a great amount of time fact-finding. I knew my private sector service relatively well. We consider ourselves as being quite high performing. Um, and I wanted to look at the customer journey on both sides of it. So I mapped out our customer journey for accounts for the private sector. So that's owner occupiers and um, and housing association tenants and private rental sector tenants. And it was quite a straightforward delivery of service. Tenants, um, residents would expect to receive their adaptation within about 90 to 100 days. That, that would include a, an occupational therapist assessment. Um, on the whole, there may be a handover from social services to the city council. Equally, if clients come directly the council there wouldn't be and everything was broadly dealt with within one single team um, and it was a consistent team striving to deliver an adaptation for, for an individual whereas with council tenants i don't expect anyone to be able to read these slides but it, these these little boxes of different stages throughout the process and previous work slide to this slide you can see the length is significantly more there was, there was about five or six handovers between different organisations. So if, if you were a council tenant and you wanted an adaptation, you'd, you'd be handed across between different organisations between five or six times. And ironically, if you phoned up the city council for an adaptation, the first thing we would say historically as a landlord was go to social services. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't pay any attention to our tenants until they'd gone through the social services scheme. So it was, a five, I'd say, five or six hand, handovers between different organisations. And each of those organisations involved had very, very different priorities. And it wasn't tenant-focused, as my fact finding found out. It, it didn't really look at, at, it didn't really play to the individual needs. It played to each of, as, as each organisation was handed across, each organisation played to their own strength. Um, and that wasn't always to the benefit of the individual potential. So that was quite disappointing to find out. And here's what I really found out, is that in the private, the demand for council tenants adaptations was significantly higher. It was about 20% higher than the rest of the private sector. Yet the budget was around about half of the budget um, in the private sector. The time scales were significantly different. So in the private sector, we were delivering adaptations in around about 100 days. This is all pre-COVID, I should say, this data. Um, and in council tenants, it was difficult to get a true figure because the, they didn't record in, in quite an accurate fa fashion. But the sample recording indicated that it took about, on average, 220 days for an adaptation to be delivered for a council tenants, which isn't terrible, but it's uh, um, when you compare it to a private sector within the same local authority area, obviously that was quite poor. Staffing levels in the private sector, we had a team of about 8 point, well, it's about 8.5 uh, full-time equivalents delivering those adaptations. Whereas with council tenants, there was lots of sort of people in and around it, but, but actually when you looked at full-time equivalents working on it, we worked out at 2.6 full-time equivalents for working on, on council stock adaptations. And then when you looked at the assistances available in the private sector, we had um, DFGs, we've got a DFG contribution grant, a discharge grant, small works grant, vendor permission hospital grant, DFG top-up grant. We had a whole manner, a whole host of different assistances available to, to residents. Whereas as a council tenant, although we're a good landlord and properties are safe and warm and healthy, um, on the whole, there was just the, the only offer available to residents was minor and major adaptations. Minor being grab rails and the like, and major inverted commas would be um, the traditional adaptations, which are the showers around the service.
rather disappointingly, what I did find was that um, I, know I loathed to put the numbers, but it was quite scary that tenants in the city council were far more likely to have an adaptation of views compared to their private sector counterparts, significantly more likely to be refused an adaptation, often under the guise of wanting to make the best use of stock. That, that seemed to be a phrase that was coming up time and time again. We've got to make best use of stock. We've got to make best use of stock. And it seemed to be used as a bit of a stick to control people. And often we'd be refusing adaptation for people in the guise of making best use of stock. But I found through an analysis of the properties that were being refused that we were saying you can't have the adaptation and the tenants were not moving into presumably better or more suitable accommodation for them. So no one was willing was the, the reality was that you know, people were having an identifying need and we weren't adapting their identifying need and they weren't moving. So they were staying in the house, probably struggling and we weren't getting a family home back into it. So that was a that was a big thing I identified that people were being refused adaptation often because of under occupancy because we would want to get uh, a, what is perceived to be a family home back into use for a family where it might be a, an older a single person or an older couple not recognizing that that older couple might have been in their tenancy for, for 50 years 60 years in some instances so um, so that was what i found and it was quite it was quite sad but but what i did have was a lot of commitment from our, our ruling cabinet and our members, and particularly our deputy leader, who was also the portfolio holder for, for housing, was really recognised. She didn't know the information, she couldn't put her finger on it, but she recognised there was a problem. She was a real driving factor behind this uh, changes. So, so I had, I felt that I had a lot of um, support in, in bringing through change. So what I ended up doing was writing quite a lengthy cabinet report. I can share it, to, I think I've shared it to Paul actually, and I'm not happy, but if anyone wants to see the cabinet report, I'm happy to give you a copy of it. It's fairly lengthy, but but what what I recommended, I, I wrote the cabinet report that went to cabinet in October, recommending that the current assistance for council tenants was enhanced or replaced with a suite of grants. So, Looking at tenure neutrality, I wanted to offer tenants disabled facilities grants. I thought that was really, really important. Disabled facilities grants set out in statute exactly when you will and won't adapt to property and, and what you will and won't do. So, and, and that, that legislation might change um, and aligning ourselves with that legislation gives us scope for growth, more scope for change within it. And, um, and I thought if we really wanted to be tenure neutral, um, social social landlord properties within Norwich, those tenants are tied for DFG, so it made sense to me that we offer DFGs for the tenants of the city council as well, although it would be HRF funded DFGs. As well as that, in Norwich we offer a top-up grant, or it's a, con it's a contribution grant, so Anyone that has an, a, a means-tested contribution, Norwich pays the first five thousand pounds of that calculated contribution. So it wasn't just a, a standard DFG approach. There was a bit of a caveat that, that um, we have that, that discretionary assistance. As well as that, I wanted to ensure that we had some clear mechanisms in place for hospital discharge grants and preventive admissions hospital grants. So getting people out of or preventing them going into hospital. Norwich has got a 10k non-means tested assistance available for people to, to help with those things. So I wanted to make sure tenants have access to that. The other thing that I recommended to uh, Cabinet was that the operating model of the home improvement team that we deliver in the private sector was replicated for council tenants, so they're offered to be a high level of service. I wanted to increase the budget from 750k to 1.5 million for the next two financial years. You can't the budget set much longer than that in the future, but um, so that's that's why I only said it for the next two years. Um, and to immediately create one full time caseworker role and one full time senior caseworker role again, initially on a two year fixed contract. I'm really pleased that that, re that uh, report was unanimously went through the October cabinet and really 
well received. Um, so, so that's what we're doing about it. After this is it. Afterwards, um, the deputy leader spoke to me, and I'm, I'm quoting to myself here, or I'm kind of paraphrasing myself, but she, she said, okay, you've done all this, what does that mean for the future? And I, I replied with something along these lines, um, and I thought it was a nice way to sort of tidy up the, the end of this presentation. I said, said to her something along the lines of, the concept of tension neutrality needs to be improved over the next two years. There will be challenges, we've got some quite unique challenges in Norwich around them. Um, around our contractual arrangements of who delivers our adaptations and that's that's going to be some hurdles that I'll need to get over. Um, but it is believed that the recommendations that we approve for the Cabinet will result in more, more tenants getting the help that they faster, but more importantly, more focus on them as individuals and that's what we're really hoping will come through in the future. I'm a firm believer of um, caseworkers and I think the two new roles uh, that we've created will make a difference to, to ensuring that tenants, tenants' voices are heard when they're offered adaptations. So finally, a little bit of a plug, I'm recruiting at the moment. So um, I'm recruiting an OT and I'm recruiting a senior caseworker and I'm also recruiting a, another caseworker as well. So I think they're really fantastic opportunities to be joining a really uh, an interesting time to deliver all this tenure neutral work um, and if you're joining a really passionate team that really wants to help people so if you're interested do get in touch um, and I'll take a look at the questions now. Uh, right, thanks Ken, up there there are some questions. Uh, let, me, let me scroll back to the start. So quite a few people want a copy of your um, cabinet report. Brilliant, I shall um, send that across. There's um, a, a couple of a kind of a question in the comment around um, a couple of local authorities refuse major adaptations such as extensions. Did, did you have that kind of issue before? Did you, was, was that kind of part of the um, kind of refusal thing? But yeah, I think it's going to be quite an interesting. I think the whole extension uh, conundrum is going to be an interesting thing to take up the line with my senior management team. So often I've found that, that this did come up and there is a real need for, for either extensions or other properties. I think the problem is so often there's a lot said about, oh, we need to move into a more suitable property. But what is apparent to me is that those, in inverted commas, suitable properties feel like they're unicorns, that they don't really exist, or if they do exist, they don't come onto the housing register very often or if at all. So, uh, it's going to be an interest in 24 months when it comes to yes. extensions. I think historically the city council has refused them. I think going forward, I'll be putting options forward to extend properties, and we will see. We will have to. I will make have to make a business case in each instance yes. to to um, to get discretionary assistance above the statutory 30k. So we don't, I didn't purposely write in the policy um, for discretionary assistance above 30k because our RRO policy to go above 30k is, is a secured loan, so that wouldn't work for us as a landlord. Um, but, but, so I didn't put it in, but, but clearly there's an understanding that if we need to spend more, we will spend more, but um, it'll have to be a business, a business case driven Way yeah. of it. So I, pre I presume your kind of approach to means testing is the same for council tenants as it is for everybody else now? Yeah, absolutely. So everyone will apply for a, a statutory DFG. But as I said, in Norwich, we pay the first £5,000 of any calculated contribution. Rough analysis. I didn't go into it in too much detail, but to my, to my knowledge, I think we've had one, we've done a Probably we probably do about 50, 60 housing association adaptations a year, and I think in the last five years we've probably had one or two where they have had a calculated one. Okay. Um, how, how's your how's your spend going this year? What on the private sector or for councils? Um, both, both, I guess. <laughs> uh, not as good as previous years. Okay. Um, so I think I'm projecting 
been an underspend on both. Um, the council stock side of things has got some real nuances around it that I won't bore anyone with. Um, on the private sector side of things, it did take a bit of time to mobilise uh, post-COVID. I'm projecting an understand of between 250 and 300k. And I have a meeting with our commissioners straight after this presentation to try and get commitment for them to let me roll it over. So we'll see how that goes. Great. And there was one last comment about, uh, it's from David Arco from Amber Valley. Um, which I, I, probably doesn't apply to you, but it's about kind of implications of stock transfer. But um, but there, there is a report coming out in the new year, David, about um, housing associations and adaptations that we've been working with Sheila McIntosh on. So that will be available um, probably April, May time. Oh, and there's um, Sheila just popped up with a message at the same time. So um, yeah, the, David, she, she, Sheila's writing that, that report as we, well, probably not as we speak, but but certainly at the moment. Um, yeah. Did you, uh, kind of an issue that kind of Callie's raised, which um, probably is more, is more kind of a, a national policy one, that um, DFG doesn't pay for council properties, but it does pay for other tenants. And um, so other tenants don't get adaptations, I suppose, effectively paid out of their rent. Did, did that cause any issues for your politicians or, or did they just kind of... No, my politicians no. were very, very supportive of, of this. So I don't think, for them, it's not a problem. I, I know that in other authorities, other stock owning authorities, there has been sort of some moves to for the BCF to be used on council premises. But broadly speaking, we've got commitment to... Norwich tops up the BCF anyway, on the private sector side of things with uh, an additional £300,000 Yep. into the box the year. So, so we're quite fortunate that we've got quite quite engaged politicians who want to see the best for their residents and find the money where possible, whether it's right. for council stock or private sector. Um, I've, I've just noticed we've got a hand up, so I don't know if Louise wants to, to ask her a question personally. So I'll, I'll click on allow to talk, Louise, and you feel free to switch your microphone on and, um, and ask the question yourself. Nope. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that one then. So thank you, Kevin. That was great. Um, I said there's, there's a few few people put their email addresses. They would love a copy of your, um, your report. I, th I think we've got a copy. I've got a copy, haven't I? So, um, uh, would you mind yeah. calling? Are, are you okay to call that call? Yeah, I'll, I'll ask somebody in the office to, um, to um, download everybody's email address and send them a copy. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Okay, back to back to polling. Um, next one. We've just been talking about staff, haven't we? So, um, local authorities deploy staff to deliver efficient and effectively. So it's about having a single person responsible for the customer journey, colo co-locating staff, as, as Kevin has done, use of trusted assessors, and then possibly using disabled staff as well. So starting from the bottom, working up again for staffing, so not yet established, is assessment and grant application are delivered by separate teams, organisations based in separate locations. So plans in place, there are organisational development plans in place to, to address this. Established, you've got joint, work, joint working and co-location, with appropriate supervision of staff and staff are involved in service improvements. Mature, you have an integrated multidisciplinary team appropriately trained with vertical integration and exemplary, you have a key worker identified to act as the main point of contact from start to finish and you have succession planning in place. So where do you fit on this scale?
So again, this, this is a fairly mixed picture, I think, kind of half and half and half. Oh, actually, it's kind of third established, a third better and established, and a third less than established. It'd be really interesting. We, we'll put these on a um, radar chart or, or kind of spider graph afterwards so we can see um, how they vary. Okay. Next section is around being person centered. So this is around um, disabled people not having to search out for other services. So there's a single holistic assessment and then home adaptations are delivered collaboratively, collaboratively with other complementary services like equipment, minor adaptations, handy persons, repairs, home from hospital, etc. So not yet established would be where a DFG applicant is not offered access to other funding or services as part of a grant application. Plans in place would be you have plans in place to broaden this service offer. Established um, DFG plus a limited package of services and measures to meet some needs, but client will need to apply separately for some related services. Mature, you have a holistic caseworker assessment resulting in a range of services from different funding streams and providers. An exemplary, it would all be co-produced with client, family and carers to meet needs and wants to improve well-being and deliver outcomes. So where do you rate on person-centeredness? So I think this one's probably the highest score to date, I think, with 50% um, or so. Actually, kind of 90% established or higher for person-centeredness, which is um, good news. Yeah, I think there are three left to go. So number three is public information. So disabled people know where to go for help and support with home adaptations. So the availability of assistance support is publicised, um, public information designed with in consultation with disabled people, GPs and community health workers are trained and initial points of contact are well known and include triage and signposting. So that's an overview of, of this um, criteria. So again, starting from the bottom, if not yet established, website details do not exist or are out of date. Don't give contact details for the contact point, and there's no advice or information line. Plans in place so that you're reviewing and revising this. Established, so there's basic info on your website about DFG, but you have disconnected access points with limited options for advice. Uh, mature, you have integrated info on both the kind of housing and care elements on a range of platforms, including face-to-face, -face, online and telephone, with signposting as appropriate. And then exemplary is it's all developed with users, is it's in an accessible format. You have interactive decision-making tools to give a personalized response, maybe use forums and communities of interest to develop um, your approach. So where do you fit on public information? So on, on that one, um, eighty-six percent at established or higher. I think that's possibly the lowest one on exemplary so far, but there's um, quite a high score on mature. Hmm. 
Number two, so the penultimate one is co-production. So disabled people are involved in the design of adaptation services. So reviewing and improving delivery um, could be part of an advisory group or a user board and use satisfaction surveys and feedback to improve delivery. So not yet established would be that disabled people have not been actively involved in developing local policies and strategies. And they're probably not active participants in their own adaptations either. Plans in place, you have strategies in place to develop co-production and person-centered approaches. Established and you have feedback forms routinely analyzed and used some choice in design and there's a casework role to reach solutions. Mature, you have strength-based assessment solutions developed jointly with the person and carers and you recognize that people are experts in their own lives. And at exemplary, you have a user forum, including carers that review and make recommendations. And you may also have um, an element of personal budgets built into your delivery. So where do you fit on co-production? So this one's, I think, um, possibly the lowest score overall. It's quite a few not yet established or plans in place, kind of about 40%. Just two at exemplary level, which I recognise is probably quite a high bar, isn't it, for that, for that exemplary level. So it'd be, uh, be interesting to um, see what the two of you are doing in, in that level. Uh, but good, nearly, nearly a third are at mature. Okay, so the last one, and by no means the least one, I think I think this is probably the most important one in terms of um, joining this all up and having a, having a really good service, is that local authorities understand the needs in their area and hold a joint commitment to meeting them. So you've got uh, joint strategic needs assessment or other needs analysis, representation at health and wellbeing boards or, or similar, um, senior officer commitment, and if, if you're in a two-tier area, regular meetings between senior officers, a concordat or agreement between districts and counties, um, funding allocated in accordance with need, and if it's all really linked together, some sort of memorandum of understanding on the wider issues around housing and health. So for the last time, starting at the bottom and not yet established, there's no governments or assessment of need for adaptations and no joint strategy, no joint strategies for action in place. The plans in place, um, some of the government arrangements in place, and you need um, to develop joint working further. For established housing leads are involved in, in developing and agreeing better care fund plans. For mature, um, needs assessments are in place, informing aligned strategies. Outcomes are linked to better care fund metrics and you have continuous improvement. And for exemplary, you would have a published joint strategic needs assessment for housing, shared strategy joining up housing, health and care, and metrics used to inform future commissioning. So for the final time today, where do you rate on, on the commissioning scale? And here's your last set of results. And, and sorry, Rachel, there wasn't a don't know option. So there we go. So um, what kind of 90% somewhere in the middle there between plans in place and mature. So thank you for all of those. We will um, publish the results and add in the, um, 
um, comments from the from the chat box. And then if, if you want to go through the um, DFG quality standard to your own pace sometimes, you can um, do it a bit more slowly, assess where you are, and um, do a little bit of benchmarking across the rest of um, the other local authorities across England. So I think there's been about, um, about 200 people here today, so I think it'd be a good, uh, good indication of, of where we are. Although I suppose what we do new, normally find is that um, people who attend these events are probably higher towards the higher end of, the, of this scale than the lower end of the scale. So um, if, if for some of these you do find yourself perhaps slightly lower than the benchmark, I don't think it would necessarily reflect the full position across the country. got some really big news. At Foundations, offering advice and support to help others provide accessible solutions has always been at the heart of everything we do. We always strive to ensure our services are open and accessible to all who need us. Continuing on this journey, we're very proud to announce the launch of our new accessibility-friendly website. It has all the great information and interesting content that we've always offered, but in a new, fresh format which allows everyone to engage with us, regardless of your requirements. Visit us at www.foundations.uk.com and let us continue to work together to create a world without barriers. So that's, that's a little video for our new website. It's not quite there yet. If, if you can go, go to look at it and think it, it looks strangely similar to one I've seen before. Um, the new one we're hoping to launch on the 1st of December. It's, it's nearly ready. It's just having its accessibility statement tested. And um, yeah, all, all new website, 1st of December. So the other thing that I thought we'd do today, and I've kind of mentioned in the last um, two or three webinars, is looking at share adaptations and are they all the same? Um, how much tiling and decoration do people do? How do they design them? Do they replace the sanitary wear? What do they do with the floor covering? Do they fit extract fans? All, the, all these sorts of questions. So we asked people to send them in and we've had three so far. So if I'm just gonna cover them um, in outline at the moment. So please, if anybody else wants to submit, we will do um, some further work on these. So this is the bathroom plan I sent out, kind of fairly typical um, bathroom with a bath, toilet, wash basin. Um, we've got a, a little pack that gives details of the, of the person who uses the bath. And we, look, we were looking for you to send in um, drawings of what you would do, outline specification, if you can, the cost. And we did one example, we did have some photos as well, because somebody else had done a, um, um, a bathroom that was very similar. So this is what we've had in so far. I, I won't, I've, I've anonymized them at this stage. We will go into some more detail on the analysis when, when we've had a few more in. If, and if, you, if you'd like to enter, or if you'd like to submit your proposal for, for adapting this bathroom, please send us an email at info at foundations.uk.com and we'll send you the, the pack with all the details. So this was the first response I had. So it removed all the sanitary wear, put the um, shower tray in the corner, moved the wash basin, um, widened the door, um, put bifold, door, bifold shower doors in, and then tiling to the full two walls of the, um, of the walls around the shower tray. Um, so Altro Pisces flooring, moving a radiator, new light, new fan, and the estimate was around five and a half thousand for doing that. Number two, again, kind of similar design. Again, replacing all sanitary wear, um, shower former with um, bifold doors, electronic thermostatic shower, a new low surface temperature radiator and a sliding door this time rather than a, a normal hung door. And that was estimated at 
uh, just under six thousand pounds. And then this was the third one we've had, which I think is also a sliding door, but has a um, a slightly different layout in terms of the shower area itself is close to the door rather than in in the corner, and then kind of the wash basin is um, next to the toilet. There's a um, Kind of bulkhead and concealed system. Doesn't look like there's any um, shower doors on this one, but also has an electric shower. And the estimate on this one was 5,700. So if you'd like to send in your solution to this bathroom, if you can send in a specification and, and your costs, and if, perhaps if you've done one similar, perhaps um, some photos, um, we will um, compile them all and compare and contrast the different approaches. Dan's put um, our email address in the chat, so um, please do if, if you if you'd like to send us your solution, please do. And as always, just give a plug for the DFG Champions Facebook group. I had a had a question email somebody this morning who hadn't joined, um, and asked them why not because the uh, the answer to the question they posed was. Um, was very easily available within the Facebook group. So hopefully they are going to join now. I don't know if they're in the call this afternoon, uh, but there's all sorts of information on there. And um, if you need to search for something, um, there's a very nice search feature. So the question this morning was about drop curbs. Um, so if you want to find out if you can install a drop curb using DFG funding, then um, you can search for curbs on, in the DFG Champions Facebook group. Um, and for those of you who wonder, the answer is yes, you can. The DFG Surgery. Your questions answered. So let's have a look. Have we got any questions in the uh, question and answer box? If anybody else wants to pop one in either the question and answer box or the chat box, or if, if you want to raise your hand, you, you can ask me in person if you want to. Um, Carol was asking if DFGs are ever used to provide uh, facilities for hemodialysis at home. Um, it can be, I think, but usually um, what we've seen is that um, usually people who have hemodialysis are also receiving um, um, continuing healthcare funding and that can fund the adaptations. So um, that's usually the, uh, the better route to go down, I think. And um, there is, I can't remember the name of the, the, the association, it's kind of either either an association to do with kidneys or dialysis um, that does do a fact sheet on using um, continuing healthcare funding for those sort of adaptations. Um, an anonymous attendee, I think, asked this question while um, Kevin was speaking about um, a council operator blanket policy for major works, including extensions and internal configurations. And the biggest adaptation they do are wet floor showers. Um, I, I think kind of kind of the answer to this one is that's not a um, a sustainable position to take. Um, if you look at the case from Islington, which we covered was pro probably four or five months ago now. That was clear that you you can't force somebody to move, and if somebody makes an application for a grant. Um, you have to consider it properly. Whether the landlord would give permission wasn't properly tested in that case, but I think they would find it really difficult to um, defend adaptations in any circumstances. So um, I, I definitely challenge that. So another question, uh, regard to access to the garden, has anybody had experience when there is a front and rear garden and who decides which to adapt. Um, provide front access to provide access to front garden. Would access to rear garden be eligible? I think it's um, it's it's one of those questions where you have to work through the um, work through the criteria in the, in the legislation. So access to a garden is is definitely one of the priorities. Sorry, not one of the priorities. One one of the purposes that a grant must be given for. So then you have to work through what, what, are the, what would be the relevant works to give access to the garden. Um, 
So you may think about access to the front garden, access to the rear garden, and then you would look at whether that's necessary and appropriate. And it's, it's very helpful if, if you have some guidance on how you would deal with necessary and appropriate. It's not great in terms of guidance in the, in the current um, national guidance, but hopefully at some point not too far from now, there, there will be some new guidance and, and maybe it will be a bit more helpful in terms of um, how you decide on necessary and appropriate. Um, Andrew's asked about child applications for divorced parents where children live 50-50. Um, the current guidance says that or recommends that you use discretion to do both. Um, Diane's asked, uh, can we expect to see considerations for technology enabled care solutions within DFG criteria in the future? Can text be part of an add-on for a DFG application, um, such as installation of lighting, acoustic monitoring, or increased home security? Um, so there already is purpose in the legislation for controlling heat and power and other aspects of the home. Um, I, th I think most of those would already fall under that purpose. There was a recommendation in the DFG review that um, issues around technology are increased well, and there comes a smart grant, which I think is being considered at the moment. Certainly the, um, if you remember the, the Conservatives as part of their last manifesto, were talking about an all age disability strategy. And I think that that's definitely being considered as part of that. So um, the answer is you can probably do most of those under the purpose of controlling heat, light and power at the moment, um, but there may be more in the future. And thank you, Dan, for putting the um, benefits and support information for the National Kidney, Kidney Federation. That, that was the, the organisation I couldn't quite remember. That's in the chat box for you. Um, if you have any more questions, um, why don't you go along to the DFG Champions Facebook page and, and put them in there like um, I think about 1,200 of your colleagues. And just another reminder that we do have lots of free training available for anybody who works for or with a home improvement agency in, in some, sort of, um, some sort of way. And all these are available as relatively short e-training courses, um, take about 30 minutes to an hour each one. You get a little certificate at the end of it if you need to collect your CPD. So it's a nice easy way at the end of the year to, to get a bit of CPD in. Um, if you're not out and about doing visits, and perhaps you get a, a few of these done. Um, if you're a manager of a home improvement agency, then um, email us and we'll set you up on the system and you can award all these courses to your own staff. If you just want to do one or two by yourself, then there's a form on the foundation's website that you can fill in um, and just apply to do um, yeah, a couple, couple of these individually. But um, they're all available free of charge if you work for or with a home improvement agency in some way. All free. Thanks to our friends at Taylor Wimpy. So thank you for coming along today. Hope you found it useful. I, I found it really, uh, really interesting to look at uh, where everybody rates on the DFG quality standard. It'd be interesting to put those um, stats and figures together with, together with the comments in the chat box and see where we are. Um, this time next week, we'll have a special webinar on housing and dementia, which um, should be a good session. I think there, there's some, some really interesting, um, really interesting presentations, including one from our, our own Yasmin and, and Francis, who've been doing some work on this around um, how, how dementia fits into regulatory reform order policies or housing assistance policies and how different local authorities use it. As I mentioned before, we will have the virtual DFG Champions Roadshow and the National Healthy Housing Awards on the 1st of December. Um, Dan, if you can pop the link back in the chat um, where you can have exhibitor booths and we will have a quiz. And it, it, it is an amazing quiz and we've got a couple of other um, special little bits and pieces that we'll be um, using as well. And that there may be some news on, um, on the 1st of December that, uh, that you might be interested in as well. Maybe before the 1st of December, but there's um, some news on the way um, that I can't mention any more about. And there will be uh, another webinar in December on adaptations for children. And we've got lots more content lined up for the new year. So as I said, we're supported by um, Ministry of Housing Communities and Local Government, which means that pretty much everything we do is, is free. So if, uh, if you want to get in touch, um, 
go to the website, email us, go to the DFG Champions Facebook group. Um, lots of people message me there from the um, send me Facebook messages from there as well, actually. So any, any way you want to get in touch, please do, and uh, happy to help. So um, see you again next week. Thank you.